Hello and welcome. I am Spinal CSF League Foundation Executive Director Andy Buchanan, and with me today is Dr. Tim Amrine. Dr. Amrine is an Associate Professor in the Department of Radiology at Duke University Medical Center, where he also serves as the Director of Spine Intervention. Dr. Amrine is here today to discuss with us his recently published paper titled Efficacy of Epidural Blood Patching or Surgery in Spontaneous Intracranial Hypotension, a Systematic Review and Evidence Map. Dr. Amrine, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join everybody today, and I appreciate your interest in this, Andy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first of all, congratulations on this important paper. And can you just tell me a little bit about this? Um, what is a systematic review, and what is an evidence map, and why are they so important? Yeah, that's a great question. So a systematic review is a type of research where it's an attempt at kind of an evidence synthesis. So what do we know about what's in the medical literature? And so there's a formalized process for doing that, for reviewing all of the, the world's medical literature. Um, this was actually a very rigorously done study that was driven by a protocol that we developed beforehand uh, and a priori. And you kind of go through the process of pulling all of the potential articles that could meet a certain criteria. In this case, articles that were discussing the efficacy of epidural blood patching or surgery in SIH. And you work with a team to try and determine which articles actually meet particular inclusion and exclusion criteria. That then allows you to have a whole cohort of papers, a whole group of papers that discuss that. Uh, in this case, uh, it was all the papers from, I think, October of 2021 throughout the history of time. Um, and we reviewed all those papers and then were able to come up with summary statements about what's in the literature and what do we know and what do we not know. And so that's the overarching goal of a systematic review. There are some subsets to that. So a lot of times you'll hear systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And so what a meta-analysis is, is you uh, do some um, fairly complicated statistics uh, to try to get at an understanding of uh, effect sizes and how well certain treatments work um, so that you can get uh, a better estimate of, of an effect by pooling a bunch of data from a bunch of different papers. We didn't do that in this case uh, because I think what uh, we found really is that the state of the literature uh, in our world of SIH and efficacy is really not quite ready yet for uh, meta-analyses. Um, we can kind of get into a little bit more of that uh, as, we, as we talk, but it, instead what we did was an evidence map. And so that's a type of systematic review where um, we uh, kind of map the evidence and sort of say, here's what's out there this is what we're seeing, and draw some general conclusions about it and recommendations for, for what we might do moving forward. Has this kind of research or this level of research ever been done before in terms of SIH and spinal CSF leak? I don't think so. I think this is the first systematic review and evidence map. There, were some, uh, there are some systematic reviews at the time of the publication uh, that, that we wrote here. There were three that had been previously done. Those included meta-analyses, um, some were very narrow in scope, and some were kind of broader and more general. Uh, but I don't think anybody had done a scoping review or evidence map like this before. Wow. Um, so in the paper, you investigate the efficacy of epidural blood patching or surgery. And what does efficacy mean in this context? Is there a medical definition that's different from the common understanding of the word as something that works? If we know that something works, why do we need to quantify it? And then also, I guess, crucially, how do paper authors determine if a treatment works or not? Yeah, I think it's a real critical question. I think the definition is a little more complicated than, than uh, might, you, might meet the eye at the surface. I, I think it's very reasonable to assume that efficacy means the general, generally, uh, general understanding that, you know, how well something works. Does a treatment work? The medical definition, though, is a little bit more nuanced, um, and there are kind of two sides to the coin, efficacy and effectiveness. So what efficacy means is how well does a treatment work in an expert's hand in an ideal situation, right? So if you come to a major center like Duke or the Mayo Clinic or Cedars-Sinai and one of the experts is, is treating you using their techniques that they do all the time, how well does it work? Does that procedure actually work? On the other side of the coin is effectiveness. And so effectiveness research is how well does a treatment work in the real world? If you don't go to an expert and you're just getting it done generally in the community and there's all these other variables that are involved that are not controlled for, does that treatment work or not? And I think those are slightly different questions that sort of get at the, the same concept. At the end of the day, it's really about 
are we applying treatments that are actually working, right? Because if we're applying treatments that don't work, then that's not going to get anybody better. Right. Um, I imagine when you're looking through these these papers to, to try to figure out efficacy of these things, um, it's probably important to know what kind of a CSF leak a person had. Um, I think in the paper you noted that many authors did not specify the subtype. Can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think was apparent to to the author group, which actually included authors from the Mayo Clinic and, and at Duke, um, is that when we critically appraise the literature and read through it as we're trying to decide what are the best things to do for our patients, it becomes apparent that there are some papers where it's unclear whether or not the patients actually have SIH. So there's some heterogeneity there in the papers. But the other thing that's really clear is in many of the papers, they'll describe the outcomes of how patients did after an applied treatment, be it surgery uh, or blood patching or now the embolization procedures for cerebral CSF venous fistulas. But uh, in some of those papers, they're not describing what subtypes of leaks are being treated, right? And so uh, I think that's important to know because there may be differences in how certain types or subtypes of leaks respond to certain treatments. So for instance, maybe that we find out fistulas don't respond to blood patching, or maybe they do. Um, but if we don't know who we're treating, we may not be able to understand that, that subgroup analysis. But I think it's really critically important because there are fundamental pathologic differences between the different CSF leak types. The paper that we looked at, I'm, I'm looking at it now, is something somewhere around uh, 79 uh, out of the total studies, 130 something studies, did not really report what type of CSF leak um, uh, they were looking at or the subtype. So it's a really very common problem, I think, with the literature and one that's, that's uh, I think, easily correctable in the future. So how does a paper like this ultimately affect patient care? Are there specific recommendations that came out of this paper? Yeah, I, I think there are. Uh, so I think that um, what this paper allows us to do is sort of look at the literature as a whole. Um, and there's a couple of things that we can kind of touch on as we go through. But uh, let me try and find, we did have some summary comments here. So we recommended that uh, future research uh, confirm that patients have SIH. And so uh, we should be applying the, the, S, the ICHD3 criteria or whatever diagnostic criteria is current at the time for whether or not a patient has SIH. Because if you're trying to talk about how are patients with SIH responding to a treatment, we need to know that's who we're actually treating, right, and not have a heterogeneous group of some people who may have other causes of headache or other causes for their symptoms. Otherwise, we're sort of getting a, a very biased view or uncertain view to, of how those treatments work for SIH patients. That was one important piece. Uh, we also thought that uh, people should re explicitly report the subtypes of CSF leak. And I think we just spoke on that a little bit. Um, but it would be helpful to not only talk about who these, who's being treated but what, how those different subtypes are responding to the treatment in question. So subgroup analyses, how do fistulas respond, how do nerve root sleeves respond, how do discosteophytes spur type leaks respond. Um, the other thing is uh, some of the important key procedural details are often missing in the literature, and I think there's an opportunity for, for improvement in future uh, publications as well. So uh, for instance, in many of the papers that we reviewed, it was difficult to determine whether or not an epidural blood patch was targeted to the site of a CSF leak or non-targeted. Right, and, and many of us believe that could be a real critical difference, right? Similarly, whether or not fibrin glue was used or the type of patching material, or in the surgical literature, what type of surgery was done, right? Um, so if we don't report those details, it's hard to know how the treatment that we're going to apply for one individual patient or a group of patients at our individual centers uh, will respond, right? Because we can't really generalize uh, the, under the literature, the conclusions in the literature. Um, and then I think the other thing that's really important is to use some sort of objective outcome measures. And so I think this was very pervasive in the literature, um, is that a lot of the papers that we reviewed would say that patients did better, uh, but that was also often a subjective interpretation, either based on the patient's reporting uh, or in some cases based on the physician's opinion about how the patient was doing, right? And so there are some fundamental problems with that because it introduces bias. Um, and if there's an opportunity for us to use objective measures that have been validated, um, uh, you know, some sort of headache measure score or a composite score for SIH symptoms, I think that's really critical, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we can talk more about that. But those are some of the, 
some of the, the major recommendations that came out of this paper. Yeah, I imagine following up at, a speci at specific times for a specific period of time would also be really useful in terms of knowing the true efficacy. Absolutely. You know, I think there's a fundamental difference uh, between following a patient one to two weeks after a procedure, or even if they've gotten a blood patch and they're still in the hospital within 72 hours and saying everybody does great after blood patches versus following them out a year later, right? right? And I think those are the sorts of things that are really important. Um, it's also really important, I think, to, to be able to compare between groups is to collect that outcome measure at the same time, right? And so if we look at everybody at three months, then we might be able to compare different treatments. Uh, you know, how is embolization working uh, versus epidural blood patching for fistulas, for instance? Are there any studies like that on the horizon? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the groups uh, that are interested in this are working toward that. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that uh, became clear as we looked at sort of the levels of the evidence and the different types of studies that uh, are out there is there is uh, very little in terms of prospective studies, and there are no clinical trials. And so, you know, one of the uh, goals of this evidence map is really not to be critical of the literature. That's actually not the point. It's to identify um, areas of knowledge and then knowledge gaps. And, and so one of the points of this paper is to point out here are the gaps, right? Here are the opportunities for us to fill those gaps and how we might do that moving forward. And so, yeah, I think that's the next step, actually, is to do a lot of these prospective studies where we kind of do a lot of comparative assessments of different treatments for different patients uh, who have SIH. And when you say a prospective study, what, what does that mean and how is that different from the kinds of studies that already exist in the literature? Yeah. And so uh, in the paper, we have uh, these nice bubble plots uh, that, that sort of show uh, with, with each bubble representing an individual um, study. And actually, I might, can I share my screen? Maybe we can do that and I can show you what one of these look like. Let's see how this works. Great. So this is from the paper and here's an example of what one of the bubble maps looks like. And we did a, a series of these. Um, each of these individual circles represents a separate paper that we reviewed. And you can see the size of the circle is directly correlated to the number of patients that were involved in the study. So the larger the circle, the larger the number of patients. And so for this map, what we're looking at is epidural blood patching in patients who had SIH and the type of guidance used. Was it imaging guided or not guided? Uh, and then we looked at the levels of evidence. And so um, what we're seeing here is there's different studies that could be done. And the lowest level of evidence is expert opinion. So um, you get an expert from a center, uh, maybe Dr. Shevink or something, gets up and says, this is what I think um, we should be doing. Um, and expert opinion is great, but is dependent on, you know, your trust in that expert. Uh, and even the best of experts, like somebody like Dr. Shevink, could potentially have a bias uh, or could be incorrect because you're limited to only what you see at your center and in your experiences. So what we know from the medical literature is that uh, – there are different study designs that increase our confidence that what we're finding is a real finding and is the truth. And uh, they begin at the lowest level with things like case series. So we report a series um, of CSF to venous fistulas for the first time, which is like that sentinel paper that came out from the Cedar sinai group in 2014. Uh, those are great papers, right? They, they can really change practice like that did, but they are limited in their scope. They only tell you about a couple of different patients. As we go up the different study designs, you can see one of the most popular ones here is actually a retrospective cohort study. And so what that is, is we take a series of patients and they are followed over time. Um, so we maybe see them before a procedure, we ask them how they're doing or collect some imaging data, uh, do the procedure and then follow them at a specified time period afterwards typically and say, hey, what's the change? How are they doing? Are they getting better? That's what a cohort study is. The prospective and retrospective is a little bit about planning and the timing behind it. So with a retrospective cohort, what we're doing is we've already collected those data and then we're going, hey, you know what would be great is let's go back and look and see how we did with all those patients. When we do it retrospectively, it's a lot easier to do. However, we're entirely dependent on how well we did in collecting those data Right, And if we don't uh, do it in a systematic fashion up front, we end up with very heterogeneous data uh, with a lot of uncertainty, like collections at different time points or subjective uh, outcomes assessments, et cetera. And so there's a lot of bias that's, that could potentially be introduced with retrospective studies. 
when we move forward with prospective studies, they're a little more complicated because we have to get uh, patient consent beforehand, and usually there's a protocol written out about how we're going to do things. But that gives us the opportunity to collect the same measures at specified time points. And then we get some really clear understanding of, of let's say, for instance, we're going to use something like a HIT-6 or a pain score. We might be able to collect that on, from a patient right before we do the procedure and then always collect it at two months afterwards. And then we'll have a whole group of patients where we can say, hey, at two months, this is what we're seeing. So those are really powerful studies. As we kind of move up the ladder, eventually we get to things like randomized controlled trials. And the specifics of that, where we randomize two groups, is that um, that allows for removing a lot of confounding, uh, which are some variables that we don't know about that could uh, affect the study. And so um, at the end of the day, really what we want to do is move up the evidence chain here uh, to try and improve our certainty that there is efficacy to patching or to, to other procedures, um, and then do that in a fashion where we're comparing different procedures to be able to make um, you know, definitive statements about what's best for patients. So, uh, you know, we recently announced that we're partnering with Nora to build a patient registry. Um, it seems like something like that might be really helpful in aiding this kind of research. I think, yeah, I think a patient registry is going to be uh, supremely important. It's going to provide a lot of information. Um, it'll get us, uh, I think, a little bit closer at better understanding, you know, the incidence and the prevalence of SIH, which is probably much, much higher than is currently being reported. And I think it'll give us an opportunity to gather uh, kind of more nationwide or even international information about what's happening to SIH patients. How are they presenting? You know, how, how bad are their symptoms? What's their level of suffering? And you know, the other thing that's really great about registry development is that it allows, I think for the first time, at least in this space, really great opportunities to sort of um, you know, stretch, stretch our muscles, so to speak, in terms of uh, multi-center collaborative research processes and networks, right? And that sort of thing can lead to uh, multi-center research and some of these prospective projects that can launch out of that. So I think it's a real critical piece that probably will make a really big difference for this community. One thing that became really clear as we looked at the state of the literature is that there has been a real rapid uptick in the number of publications and interest in SIH over the past 10 years, and that was really heartening. The quality of the studies is improving. The number of studies per year is improving. Um, and there are the beginnings of some efforts to solve some of these recognized challenges in the literature and fill these evidence gaps. So I think the future uh, over the next decade or two or three is really extremely bright. And there's a lot of things that are, that are really excellent and exciting that are coming. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And, and thank you for all you do to accelerate research for SAH and Spinal CSF Leak. Absolutely. Thanks so much for the time.